Welcome to the 12th District. This is Kerry Condotta. We're going to do something a little bit different today. We've got a big primary coming up, a lot of candidates to choose from. We're going to talk to one of the experts on political vetting. That means how they vet the candidates before they go out and how you can help vet the candidates to decide who to vote for. A very important process that's changed over the years. We'll be talking to one of the best experts in the field when we return to the 12th District. Welcome back to the 12th District. Well, as we uh, discussed in the opening, uh, vetting candidates is becoming more important all the time. The amount of information that we can get on candidates, the background checks, the things you can find out these days are far deeper than what they used to be. The information is much more readily available. So vetting candidates is extremely important, not only for the people that are running the candidates and the candidates themselves, the parties, but also for you. As a, uh, as a voter, you want to know uh, exactly uh, what this candidate's all about, and the more you know, the better choice you can probably make. We are fortunate to have with us, with us today Kevin Carnes. He is the political director for the Republican Caucus, in, that's the House Caucus, in Olympia, Washington. And uh, Kevin and I have worked together for years in the House on what's called ATROC, that is the committee that uh, promotes Republican candidates. Now, we're not here to talk about that specifically today because he's in the middle of doing that job. What he's here to talk about is vetting the candidates, something we've been working on and improving year after year, and how it affects the outcome of elections and why you need to know about this. Kevin, welcome aboard. Thanks, Gary. Great to see you. And, uh, you know, when we first started, we didn't talk much about vetting candidates, and it suddenly became more and more important as these elections get more vicious, people get <laughs> dig deeper, it seems like. And over the years, you have really put together a, a great vetting process. There's a lot of components to it, so I just want you to kind of go over the general way you approach a candidate and what you look at when they're running for office or going to run for office. So, you know, on the House side, um, I think it's probably a little bit different process than you would look at for, say, a statewide or a, a nationwide candidate, right? Um, like, the, the, the real litmus test doesn't have a whole lot to do with ideology, but, uh, you know, the kind of that model that you, me, and Skip worked out, Carrie, was the first three things are uh, hardworking, high integrity, and connected to their community somehow, right? Um, but when you really get down into the nuts and bolts of uh, is this person someone we would be willing to invest uh, a good chunk of change in, and you know, as one of the guys that raised a lot of that money for us, you know how hard those resources are to come by, right? Yeah. Um, so we kind of have a, a pretty good process in place to really vet these folks and find out as much as we can about them uh, prior, and we're pretty upfront with them that we'll be kicking over a lot of rocks and looking into basically their whole life. Because uh, if we don't find it, the the Democrats will. Yeah, or the opponents, whoever they are. So we want to make this clear: is that this is something that these organizations like yours do, uh, parties do it. But uh, any candidate can run. It's not a matter of having to qualify to run for office in the state of Washington. We'll, we'll prove that a little bit later on. That there's some people that have more baggage than a 747, and they're still running for office. So we're not saying that you have to pass any tests or anything. It's still a free country, and you can sign up uh, as you want. But, again, if these groups or people or actually voters are going to invest in these candidates, they should know what that candidate's all about and how he fits uh, into their uh, world. So, if, you know, if they're coming out of local office, one of the first things you're going to start looking at is vote records, uh, city council, school boards. Uh, a lot of candidates for the legislature come up through local government, whether that's uh, a sewer district board or city council or school board. So, you know, grabbing that vote record and, and analyzing it for uh, budget increases, tax increases, bad votes. Um, but, you know, the, there are a lot of services out there that you can use that are somewhat one-stop shop for the big stuff. Um, you know, tax liens, judgments, um, real estate holdings, education and military records, verification 
on all that. You know, education and military are probably two of the top things that we find people fudging on. Uh, a lot of folks try and stretch a, a single into a triple, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it's really easy issue, you know. There, there's a lot of folks who may have gone to college and are two classes short of their degree, right? So don't say you have the degree. Say you attended and studied. Um, but that's one of the things that you find a lot of them try and stretch it. Uh, obviously, criminal background, that's all public record. Um, social media footprint is a huge thing nowadays. Um, you'd be surprised how many folks don't go through and maybe clean up their social media a little bit before announcing for office. You know, because there's, there's nothing more powerful than the candidate's own words. Um, you know, a tax lien from 20 years ago might be one thing, uh, but if they're saying stupid stuff on the internet last week, that's probably more relevant. Well, you know, and we got really two kind of things going on here. We're qualifying the candidate as, you know, their name recognition, their experience, and all the things that kind of go into being a candidate. But then you've got the baggage side, and that's what you're really talking about, is getting in on this baggage side and looking at all the things behind them, the things that might come up. And social media certainly has become a much bigger part of that. We look at really, to me, we look at kind of three things on that baggage side, and that is there are personal problems like divorce, uh, substance abuse, that kind of thing, uh, legal issues, DWIs, arrests, court cases, and then financial, bankruptcies, shady dealings, whatever, or just financial problems in general. Is that kind of the three things that are, I mean, there's probably more, but that's some of the big ones. Yeah, you know, um, and again, I think voters are, American voters are pretty forgiving folks, right? We love a comeback story. Um, if somebody had a bankruptcy, 10 years ago and cleared it, paid it off, and has kept their life together since, probably not a big issue. But, you know, I, I've seen candidates, Democrats or Republicans, that it's kind of a financial strategy. <laughs> As if, you know, they've got multiple bankruptcies and you watch it actually ramp up that they've learned uh, to run on the debt up prior to filing. And so, you know, when it becomes a lifestyle choice, then it starts to become an issue on would the voters trust this person with a budget? Yeah. So you've got a lot of ingredients in this package to try to come to determination. Because like you said, if you're going to put money into a candidate in a given district or in a big race, there may be four or five candidates. All these things really boil down to finding who is the most likely. In the end, it's who's going to the most likely to be elected, right? I mean, that's what you're trying to get down right. to at the end is you kind of rate them in terms of election. Um, is there anything else that, that you look at in terms of uh, any further background or any other considerations? I, you know, how important, a name recognition is important. Obviously, having office prior has some advantages, I would assume. Like a person that's never done any campaigning and never been in office, definitely starting uh, at a lower point than somebody that's done it before. You know, in the legislative races, um, you and I had a lot of success with uh, common sense conservatives that came out of local government, right? Um, and and they they've already had a connection to community, so for sure you know um, is it a mandatory requirement? Absolutely not. But you know, starting with uh, a kind of a base of name ID and familiarity in that district uh, is huge. Well, the other thing is, do they meet the district? That's something we learned that actually Frank Chop, Chop was a master of, and why he was so successful in electing candidates. You got people that are far right, far left. You got people somewhere in the middle. There are different places where different people work better. People that could get elected in some parts of Eastern Washington probably could not get elected in Puyallup or Tacoma. And so, how do you really determine that? I mean, it's kind of a, a nebulous thing. That's kind of where the art and the science meets in politics, right? I mean, I, I live in Chehalis, and you know, it's probably the most conservative county in Lewis County on the west side of the state and uh, somebody who would be a great candidate in the 20th legislative district may not quite fit the you know the 25th up in Puyallup it's different communities um, and that you know I'm going to bring it back to that last question that's kind of why somebody who's already battle tested 
uh, at the local level and got elected is really appealing to us at, at the legislative level. Um, you know, what's a deal breaker and what's not is not up to me. My job is to provide the board uh, the, the, the relevant information. Well, this is a good transition because now we're going to flip the coin the other way and say, okay, you've done your homework. You know what's going on. You know what these candidates are about. How does the average voter dig into this? What, is a, what is, should a voter look for? What should they be digging down into? I mean, they can listen to the speeches and look at the websites and get all the glory, but what, is, what can they do? Where can they find out these things? What's available for them in terms of finding this stuff? Now, you know, the opponents will put stuff on Facebook that isn't necessarily true or whatever, but I mean, seriously being able to vet these candidates, what should the average voter be looking at? So one, um, I, would, I would say both sides have a tendency, both sides of the aisle have a tendency to discount uh, information that doesn't come from a source uh, in their sphere, right? And I don't discount information just because I don't like who's providing it. Uh, because there's plenty of that. There's very few people I actually trust and like uh, in this business. But just because it's coming from a source you don't like, necessarily mean it's not true. Uh, that said, you know, public records are available to nearly anyone. Uh, court cases, your criminal records. Now, verifying somebody's military and educational credentials it's not that difficult, but it's time consuming and frankly, kind of a pain in the butt uh, going through the public records process. Uh, I, I are that at least our side of the aisle could agree on that all candidates would undertake and make it transparent and open from day one, knowing that if, if we don't find your baggage, I promise you the Democrats will. <laughs> yes, I think they will. Well, and we've had a change in the press, I think, over the years, too. I mean, there's no question that the, the press isn't as balanced as they used to be. Uh, it seems to me that, that sometimes there's actually really hit pieces on some candidates that aren't totally accurate. And then the last thing I would say is that what, something, a phenomenon we've seen in the last few years is the opponents coming in at the last minute in a last week with a flood of mail pieces or something, saying things that particularly aren't true, and then, oh, the guy doesn't make it, doesn't get elected because of it, they come back and say, oh, well, that one might not have been totally true, but oh, well, it's too late. I mean, that's the new tactic we've seen lately. That, how do you avoid that? I, I think voters are getting a little numb to that, to be honest. Um, they're pretty cynical, uh, depending on the source. But it, it is incredibly difficult, you know, uh, especially when uh, on our side, the House Republicans are typically outspent two or three to one. Um, so being ready for that is almost impossible and countering it at the last minute is really hard. Uh, I, I guess I would look at anything coming from uh, your opponents through, you know, maybe a different lens than say a news source but then again like we i agree that the news is fairly biased nowadays so uh, there's so much clutter out there there are so many sources of information that uh it's really hard for people to know who to trust you know but uh the pdc is uh public disclosure commission is a great resource for folks that want to know the financing behind campaigns uh it's gotten a lot better it's it's navigable now um but i would say just do your research and you know your vote is a commodity and don't give it away freely well i think you're right the pdc is something we didn't mention and the public disclosure commission does a good job it's an easy site to navigate you can see who's giving money to these candidates that tells you a lot something we haven't covered where's the money coming from what types of groups are supporting them and then how they spend it as well and uh that's all available. How they spend it is really important. You know, the one thing that drives me nuts is when candidates, um, but how a candidate spends their money, I think, could be indicative of how they're going to govern. Well, let's do a quick exercise. we got a few minutes left here. I want to kind of apply these rules to, uh, let's just say, a large statewide race. We won't say which one. Let's say there's about five candidates that probably have the potential to be uh, elected, but they all have various issues. Um, and we'll use numbers, we won't use names. 
But let's say uh, from five being the least electable to one being the most electable in any given race, uh, let's say number five um, in this particular situation has a bankruptcy, has financial problems, has personal problems, has uh, not ever run for office before. A lot of these red flags popping up. I mean, there's a couple candidates out there in various races that really resemble that. There are, and um, the process that the Democrats will go through with that, they will take all that baggage, they will do a focus group with uh, a certain subset of voters, and they will figure out which of those issues moves the negatives the most. Um, and then they will hone in on that message and they will pound it home uh, like a jackhammer. So regardless, if this person has large name recognition and gets through the primary, the odds are all this is going to come out in spades after the fact. I always assume that the Democrats in Washington will have the resources to get their message out. Okay, so now you've got another candidate. Let's call it candidate four. Uh, looks good on surface, has a lot of good credentials and everything, but suddenly wasn't vetted, uh, suddenly has some pretty major personal problems potentially or various other issues that come out um, very late. Uh, this person uh, probably going to have big trouble again in the in main event if they make it through. So, you know, one or two issues can be overcome. Um, like the first question I always ask when somebody comes to us and says, hey, so-and-so might have an issue. You need to dig a little deeper. I was like, well, is it true? Right? And, and then is it true? Can we prove it? Uh, because knowing something is true and being able to prove it are two completely different things. Uh, if it's on, if it's in their own words or on video, then, you know, I, I think that issue becomes amplified uh, because it's a made for TV moment at that point. Right? Right. Okay. Another one. You got somebody that is vetted. You know, you vetted this guy. He looks good on paper. He's got personal. He's okay. Financially, he's okay. He's got some experience. He's got some name recognition. But suddenly, after months of campaigning, a legal issue comes up, a big legal issue that is being really pushed hard. Is that something a candidate can overcome? I guess it depends on the level, but that, that's something you can anticipate. You could have never seen up front. I think in that case, it's really going to depend on uh, the nature of the legal issue. Um, what what kind of subset of voters would be potentially turned off about that issue? Um, and really how believable it is and how, you know, I think every American has probably had a challenge in their life they don't want on the front page of the Seattle Times, right? Um, I have, I think we all, we all have. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, is it a trust issue? Because ultimately you're trying to get people to trust you to make a decision on, the, on, on their behalf. And if that issue cuts into trust, then I think it's a problem. Okay. And again, you can't see that coming all the time. Uh, okay, another candidate. Let's call it candidate two. A lot of experience, uh, been elected, been around for some time, had some issues, but quite a while ago, nothing recently, looking pretty good lately, personally, financially, everything pretty good, but had some previous issues uh, that were, you know, not substantial, but serious. Um, how far back, let's go back to this again, how far back do you think people go? Let's say this person makes the primary. How far back can you pull these issues back from and do damage? It's good. Again, I think it's going to depend on the nature of the issue, right? Um, like a, a 15 year old bankruptcy, probably not a big deal. Um, depending on, you know, did you, did you do a chapter seven and, and screw a bunch of little old ladies out of their pensions? Then yeah. Okay. That's on the table. Um, you have a 15 year old DUI and have lived an exemplary life ever since probably not going to move the numbers. Right. And at the end of the day, um, I think a mistake that a lot of new oppo type folks or or new political operatives make is it's about the narrative and the body of work more than the aha moment. 
there are don't get me wrong there are silver bullets right but but at the end of the day you're trying to create a narrative around a candidate that I don't trust this person to make a, a decision for me right then you have you know potentially the candidate that has everything on paper but uh, maybe not as much name recognition but uh, clean on personal clean on financial clean on legal you never know what's gonna come up they're gonna find something right um, yeah so that's the thing you, you you say well that you tend to go that way because it looks good on paper but that can change uh, but uh, if somebody's got all the right ingredients and there are very few red flags is that reason enough to vote for them um, or is there still an ideology piece that has to go into it and of course this comes back to statewide versus local as I understand so I, I you know I'm pretty at the end of the day i want to win right so I, i'm willing to i'm willing to take a chance on somebody who i may be 80 20 with versus lockstep if we can win because i want to win but but at the end of the day that's got to be up to the individual voter uh and what they can tolerate and what's a deal breaker for them uh, i think ultimately uh some of our some of our folks on our side of the aisle maybe need to be a little more open-minded on what constitutes loyalty you know uh i go back to reagan is i'd rather have somebody uh, uh is the quote but at the end of the day i want to win and that's really the bottom the, line I, I mean you can't impact policy without the the gavel you just that can't that's right. Well, Kevin, it's been great to have you on board, and you and I have done a lot of work together, but we found that these things work. If you look at all the, the baggage, all the pieces that go together, inevitably those guys that have the right ingredients win. It's pretty consistent, and the people that have the baggage and have the issues don't win. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I think so. And then, you know, and then a pile of money and spend appropriately. Yeah, there's that. There's always the money thing. All right, well, we'll uh, get through this primary and we'll come back and talk some more about what happened and then we'll analyze uh, what happened, see where we're at. I appreciate your time, Kevin. All right, Kerry, good to see you. All right, all right, folks, where you have it, one of the top political analysts giving you kind of the, the, the roadmap to the client candidates, and there is a lot of variation in this year, and we're not talking about just one race. There's variation all over. We'll come back and wrap it up right after this. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, one of the experts in campaign and candidate vetting. And this is something you need to take a very hard look at each of the candidates. The most important thing is that you make a decision and you vote. These turnouts in these primaries have been very low over the past few years, and they are critical right now, especially if you want to see a change at the top in Washington State. That governor's been around about eight years, and a lot of people think that's enough. But it's only going to happen if you get the right candidate moving forward. We don't know who that is yet, but you can help with the information we just gave you. You can take a look and see for yourself. Make sure you register. Make sure you vote. Make sure you come back next week. We're going to have another great show on the unemployment compensation system. We'll see you next week on the 12th District. This is Kerry Condotta.